So I'm going to say something. Ooh, I'm going to say something very similar. The hardest thing about doing any sort of research with Chinese American history, with Chinese American names, and this is actually true of I think a lot of other, other groups, is that yeah, Chinese names are very difficult to deal with. Uh, for one thing, uh, the uh, Chinese surnames come first. So if you have somebody named Chin Dai Hui, the family name is Chin. But when the Chinese first came here, the immigration officials didn't know that. And so a lot of Chinese people had their names swap around. And so Chin Dai Hoi became Mr. Hoi. And all of his children also have the English surname, and their English name, their the surname is Hoi. But in Chinese, their name is Chin. And also the other problem is that Chinese is not written in an alphabet. So you have to figure out some way to translate these Chinese names into an alphabet. And there was no standard system of doing that. So there's like all these different systems. And so you, you look at a name like 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 the Chinese character from yellow, which also means gold. 
that can turn into English as Kwong uh, with H U A N G or Kwong H W A N G or Wang W O N G or Wang W A N G or Wang W O N. All of those are the same surname in Chinese, and you know even members of the same family they have their names translated differently. So very frustrating. Okay, so one important thing to know when researching at the Archives of the Archdiocese of New Orleans is that we are a limited access archive. So we do most of our genealogy research in-house. We have our archivist, but then also a consultant that comes in and helps us. While we do not allow in-person genealogy, we do have a form on our website to assist with locating stock in the records for your ancestors. With this, we provide you with either a certificate or a letter stating like which churches we search and any other additional information that can help you. We do wish that we could digitize everything, but we do have some resources on our website. So we have the earliest scans for St. Louis Cathedral, St. Charles of Mayo and Dutchingham, St. John the Baptist in Edgard, St. Bernard in Galvez Town, and the Royal Military Hospital. We also have the first 11 volumes of our Sacramento Records indices on there. So if you guys do need anything, our archivists are always there to help too. One tip that I will give to researchers is to ask for help. Here in, at the New Orleans Public Library, there are professionals here to help you. Sometimes you don't know what you're looking for or where to find that information, but the professionals here in the library will help guide you to find your ancestors. Uh, join genealogy societies such as like who, Creo, get involved. One of the most wonderful gifts that I received by joining my Creo is that I was on a committee for fundraising. I talked with a gentleman in California. He asked me, of course, who are you? I gave him answers. I gave him that answer. He asked several questions, and after several answers, he asked, do you know Adele? And I said, yes, she was my great aunt. He says, her husband was my uncle. And I said, Leo? He said, yes, Leo. I said, Leo was my godfather. He said, really? I said, yes. I said, but I don't know Leo because Leo died when I was four months old. And I've never, ever um, seen him. I don't even have a picture of him. That man gave me a gift that day. He sent me a picture of my godfather. So you really need to um, ask for help. I would like to say more, but I know I have time. I don't, do I have time? I have ten, <laughs> 10 seconds. Join the genealogy online societies also. Pose a question, and they will be able to help you find answers. I found out that one of my ancestors, she, she said that this lady was her mother. I knew something was wrong. Her siblings, her older siblings and her younger siblings didn't say that this lady was her mother. Come to find out someone online told me that, you know, her father had her with her mother's first cousin. Oh, okay. But a brick wall was broken. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I share a similar story with you, Catherine. I shared my ancestor's story um, at the Algiers Historical Society, and that's how I obtained a, another photo of my second great grandmother because a member of the Historical Society had it. So please, as Catherine says, share it, share your stories, and share your resources. So the second question is for Katie, Winston, Yael, Frank, Catherine, and Kim. Hold on. <laughs> What is the most interesting fact, object, or story you found researching in your area of expertise? And Katie, go first. I bet y'all think I'm going to say Bella's there, don't you? <laughs> well, guess what? I'm going to tell you about Catherine today. 
So Catherine was an enslaved woman who was sold down to Louisiana through the domestic slave trade and was purchased by Lesanne Becknell of Evergreen Plantation. She was brought there as a domestic enslaved person and he began a relationship with her which led to him freeing her. He had two children with her. She became the mistress of the plantation in every way. She ran the household. He gave her two enslaved women, one of whom was named Sally, and he paid for Sally to have hairdressing lessons to do Catherine's hair. When he died, his two sons took over the plantation. Catherine and her children moved to New Orleans, and she became a keeper of furnished rooms. Now, I wrote that article for the Southern Historical Association Conference. I thought I knew everything there was to know about Catherine, and then I discovered when digging deeper in newspaper records and court records, that Catherine had been tried for murder of Sally, the enslaved woman. It was an incredibly tragic and, and horrible case, and it um, showed through witness testimony that Catherine was abusive to the enslaved women that she owned and that had, this had been going on for many years. So what I would say to this is never think you know everything. Always dig deep. Hello, so if I seem a little disheveled right now, it's because I have to rush over here from the National World War II Museum. Uh, they, are, they were awarding the Congressional Gold Medal to Chinese Americans that served uh, during the war. In fact, Chinese Americans from all over the country you know, were coming to New Orleans to receive that medal. Uh, seven families fraught with ties to New Orleans received their medal yesterday, and I think another 12 Chinese American families from New Orleans uh, got their medal at a ceremony in Houston back in 2021. Uh, one of the families that got their medal yesterday was uh, Robert Lewis Howe, who was from Honolulu. And he was actually in his mid-30s and already married when he enlisted in the Navy Reserves. And he support, served aboard an OCIL, the Landing Craft Infantry Large, which is the larger version of the Higgins boat. So he it carries up to 200 men directly on the beach. And after the war, he uh, ended up working he actually came to New Orleans to work for the Jim Hotel. He was the executive chef there for a while. He also worked for the airport uh, travel lodge on airline, and he ended up becoming a, a restaurant manager at the Valley High. Uh, two other guys that got their medals were relatives of Harry Lee. Uh, it's uh, Johnny Nye and Wally Yip. Uh, they both won Purple Hearts while fighting in Europe during the Second World War. And Harry Lee raised a great deal of money for the D-Day Museum before it was built. And so that's why, in recognition of that, uh, they named a conference room in the Louisiana Pavilion, the Johnny and I Purple Heart Conference Room, and that's actually where their Purple Hearts are on display in the offices. And so, yeah, so that's one of the reasons we have a uh, World War II Museum is because of the Chinese American community. Right, happy Saturday, everybody. Um, one of the most interesting um, objects, pieces that I have found um, in my own research, um, it actually goes back to about 1978. It was a tape recording found in um, my deceased mother's closet, a closet that she never let us go into, because um, she had so many things. She was that person who um, found photographs of other people's houses and those photographs through legs. Um, and so I'm sure this tape recording also grew legs. Um, but this tape recording was of her own sister, who's also deceased. Um, and she was interviewed, she was doing an oral history interview with their great aunt. Um, and the tape, listening to the tape, it was from Rapid Parish, Louisiana, and it confirmed so many years of everything that I've already had in, in, my, in my research and my treats and provided information about lost churches, lost burial sites, who persons were related to from the Cane River all the way to Jonesville, um, and so about our family family just as well. And so hearing uh, a voice of a person that I had never um, met in my own life, but hearing my aunt, who's also a historian, interviewing her with such great questions and the information she was providing in these tapes and giving names of other you know, relatives that I did not have in, in my research, it provided a wealth of information, and um, I'm in the process of trying to get that recording digitized in a better quality right now. So in 1958, uh, there was a gay man named Doug Jones who lived on Carrollton Avenue, and uh, for years throughout the 50s, he would host a 
Carrollton Parade Viewing Party. This is right on the route. And this group of gay men that were gathered at his home to watch the Carrollton Parade eventually evolved into and formed the very first gay carnival crew, the Crew of Yuga, in 1958. Uh, it was an enormously popular party. It was a house party initially. Uh, they were all in drag instead of Debbie Tons, they had Debbie Tramps. Um, and it was just a, a fun way for these gay men to get together and make fun of the seriousness with which some of the straight crews take on. Uh, and so the party grew in popularity. By 1962, they had to move to a bigger location. One of the members worked at an elementary school on Veterans Highway in Metairie, which is up and coming. Uh, and they had a dance recital hall called the Rambler Room. And he said, it's a Saturday night, it'll be fine, let's have the ball there. And that ball was raided by the Jefferson Parish Police. Uh, they kicked in the doors, arrested close to 100 men. That was the end of the crew of Eagle. And everyone has always assumed that it was uh, a result of the fear and shock of the Metairie, very conservative suburban Metairie housewives calling the police. And there's a bunch of drag queens and sissies in the school. But the real story I discovered uh, is much, much more interesting. Some of you may be old enough to remember the 1950s. And it was not a baby game then. The city was very, very hostile. There were great gay bars all the time, lesbian bars as well. And one of the bars that was raided was a bar called Tony Vecinos, which was on the corner of Bourbon and Toulouse. One of the bartenders that was arrested was a drag queen named Candy Lee. And Candy Lee was so aggravated about that. That happened in 1958 as well. She would constantly complain, and she had an idea of who had dropped the diamond on the bar. Uh, and so the members of the crew got tired of hearing her moan and complain about it, so they kicked her out of the crew. And she's like, you're going to kick me out of the crew? Oh, okay. And so Doug Jones and many other members of you are convinced that it was a jilted drag queen, Candy Lee, who called the police in Jefferson Parish and said, there are a bunch of gay perverts in dresses at the school. <laughs> and so that's a very interesting story, one of, one of the million I could share. But, uh, that's my story. Hello. An interesting story of mine is that of Frank Dorr. He was the son of Henry and Mule Dorr. Eulalie and her mother, Felicity, were emancipated in St. Charles Parish in 1848. So therefore, Frank was one of the first generational um, free, per free persons of color. Hank, I mean, Frank's um, job, his chosen profession, was that of a patrolman or watchman here in the city of New Orleans. He patrolled the Jume area. When Frank arrested African Americans. Those African Americans in the Times Picayune were depicted as tar babies. They used the N word. They said that they were darkies. Racial slurs they used for African Americans. For the Caucasian Americans who were arrested by Frank. They were labeled as Mr. So-and-so or Dr. So-and-so. When Frank arrested Af African Americans, everything was fine. When he arrested Caucasians, Frank was also detained and arrested. Later, soon afterwards, he was released. In 1840, in this city, one of my female ancestors was jailed for riding the train. Frank Doyle died in 1978, in 1942, at the age of 78. He died of stomach cancer. And one of the things I want to say about Frank Doyle and his family, his family was very successful, highly respected in his community, but he also had to go through those challenges. Who's been to the Museum of the Southern Jewish Experience? Raise your hand if you've been. Oh my goodness. Okay, well all y'all have to go. Right when this is over, you just walk down the street. It's on Howard, right by Harmony Circle. 
And uh, y'all should all go. I'll tell you about my favorite object that's part of the question here. We have on display a quilt, a crazy quilt, that was made in 1885 by the Jewish Ladies Sewing Circle of Canton, Mississippi. That's just, just north of Jackson. It is a beautiful piece of textile history. If you're into that, then you will know that in 1885 there was a crazy quilt craze going on around the world. It came out of Victorian England. So first of all, that shows that the Jewish Lady Sewing Circle of Canton, Mississippi were hip to the job. They knew what the, you know, what the, the, the latest trends were going around the world. Everyone's making crazy quilts. But what's even more uh, important is the metaphor that the quilt presents to us. Because all the ladies sewed in flowers, and they sewed in their names, and they sewed in all sorts of things that meant something to them. That was then. Then put together, they raffled off the quilt to raise money for the synagogue in Canton, Mississippi. So, what that tells us is that everybody has something to contribute to improving their community. And that's the universal message that the museum talks about. It tells about some specific stories about Jews living in the South, but above that, anyone can add something of their unique personality and identity and work together and make their community better. So that's why at the end of our exhibit, we give all of our visitors a chance to sew their own quilt square. It's done electronically, so you don't need a thimble. <laughs> and add it to a big old community quilt so that everyone is part of the community. That's the message. Good message. So, question number three. What is an often misunderstood aspect about the community that you research? This question will be asked by, uh, answered by Yael, J. William, and Kenneth. Yes. Sorry, Kenneth. All right, um, this is a heavy question for me. Um, not only am I a historian of genealogy, but I specialize in antiquity issues. So I work and research for various plantations, not only researching the owners, but also researching the enslaved people who are to call it as well many times. And one of the things that I think is most often um, misunderstood is that um, African American histories of this nature is there's a lot of roadblocks, but that we don't research our own histories. And I find it very often that sometimes African American history, especially dealing with enslaved ancestors, are used for profit and for platform. Um, sometimes in a sense of atonement, when it should not be because these are someone's ancestors and they should be respected. And by allowing African Americans to tell our stories, no matter what those stories are, that is extremely important. And we have to own our own voices and we have to own our ancestors' voices as opposed to allow um, others have their own interpretation for those histories. And again, I have researched all histories, not just enslaved histories, but, and so I look at it from a people and a person aspect. Um, so I want it to be known that it should, it should always be an understanding that African-American history, especially as it comes to enslaved history, we have to be the ones to write about those histories, to interpret those histories, to give those corrective narratives instead of seeing your ancestors' information in a book that's published somewhere because you did not take the opportunity to learn and research about them. Okay, um, the, I represent the German Acadian Coast Historical and Genealogical Society, which is based in the River Parishes. Those that sit between Baton Rouge and New Orleans, St. Charles, St. John, the Baptist, St. James. So Acadians are pretty well understood because they got forcibly kicked out of Canada, and today we call them Cajuns. So that's pretty easily understood. But the Germans that settled St. Charles Parish in 1721 were not really Germans, because Germany did not exist at that time. They were Germanic. And the people that came there would not have known themselves to be German, because the majority of them actually came from Alsace and Lorraine, which is today parts of France, 
But of course, over time, we're back and forth between Germany and France. Some came from Switzerland, they came from Belgium, Luxembourg, and various parts of what is now today Germany. So the people were of Germanic origin, but they were not German. So a lot of times people you know, will contact us because they have a German last name. New Orleans was home to thousands upon thousands of Germans. From the 1820s, there was a big wave in the 1840s, 50s, and 60s, and almost right up into the, into the 20th century. But our people were here 100 years before and were speaking French within 100 years. By 1803, there was no one left on the German coast that spoke German. And when people found out their last name, like Trostclair or Heidel or Schechtsteiner was actually German, they they're actually surprised because they thought they were all French. Well, very well. Let me see if I can. Usually I have a voice, I don't need to use this. But anyway, <laughs> the result of generations of inbreeding. But in any event, uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. I'm Bill Highland. I'm a historian of St. Bernard Parish, and we have all of these Lane Yost Museum complex. And I think that uh, one of the great things that challenges us is that, first of all, people don't understand that the Canary Islands became the gateway to the Americas during the time of the Spanish Empire. Also, they don't understand the diversity of our heritage, that we are North African because we descend from indigenous people. We are Portuguese, we are Spanish. So it's really quite a knowledge. We are also Sephardic Jewish people as well. The Sephardic Jews had a tremendous presence in the Canary Islands. So those are some of the challenges that face us. And still another one is that for many years, people thought that they were French. With the exception of St. Bernard, only in St. Bernard did French families become Hispanized. For example, we had the family of Robin, and they came from Brittany, they were Acadians. They arrived in the late 1780s from France, uh, by way of Spain. And in any event, Gilles Robin was the first uh, progenitor of the family, but within one generation, his descendants were all speaking Canary Island Spanish. So that was a fair So, going on to question four, what is the event that sparked your interest in your line of work or research? And this will be answered by Frank Catherine. There are books being published almost every month on the most obscure historical topics, and yet there was nothing on queer history. Then it made sense to me, I had the epiphany. Oh, I know why. Because for so long, until very, very recently, being gay or queer or lesbian or trans or bi or whatever they called it, that was not something people wanted to document. To do so could get you evicted, could get you fired, could land you in jail or a mental institution, cut off from your family and so forth and so on. So. Uh, it's not something people wanted to document. And as I began really digging, the only primary source material I could find were arrest records. Uh, and you can't get a lot of information from that. So I began to interview old timers, uh, spent a lot of time going to some of the, the gay bars in the core. I called it field research. Um, but interviewing some of these older gentlemen and, uh, and other people and hearing their stories is what and the lack of information out in the public domain is what got me interested. Since then, I've written several books on local queer history, and I'm a columnist for three magazines, and perhaps most importantly, uh, I've co-founded and currently the executive director of a nonprofit called the LGBT Plus Archives Project, which I would visit you to look up online if you have time or interest. Everything that goes on, and that was what changed it. 
I left my internship, I graduated college, decided I was going to get a master's in public history and work in the archive. And it all started with looking at the Sakuma records of the archdiocese. Okay, uh, when I was in the eighth grade, I attended a Catholic school and our teacher required us to do a research project of interviewing one of our grandparents. My teacher was the sister of James Corville. Some of you might know the guy who elected Bill Clinton, who got Bill Clinton elected. Uh, well, his sister was my eighth grade history teacher, Louisiana history, and we had to make a scrapbook. It was a project that required each month of the school year, nine months, a chapter for each month. And you got a grade on each chapter, and in the end got a big grade. So our teacher wanted us to interview one of the grandparents, and one of those chapters was a family tree. And that's the day that I became interested. Um, she also, you know, my younger brothers had her later, my first cousins, she would keep a list of the grandparent that you interviewed to make sure that your siblings did not conduct the same research that you did years before. She was very organized. And I think she did it because she was kind of nosy. She went to her this business. So anyhow, it got me started and I forgot about that. And then when I got to LSU years later, uh, I had free time and I thought, well, you know, maybe I can go to the library between classes and, and look on this and look on that. And then I've, I've been booked ever since. And, um, um, I've, I've been doing this since 1996, so almost close, getting close to 30 years now. Now I'm not the youngest one doing it anymore. <laughs> in terms of my interest in the Canary Islanders, I was a very young man. I'd always been interested in the history of Louisiana because after all, my name, middle name is Jamari Nick. But uh, I had always been very interested in the history. But then I got to know and had the pleasure and privilege of working with my relatives who were Canarios, his later descendants. And they all said, Bill, don't forget about us. Don't forget about who we are. And do what you can to try to let people know who we are, what our culture was. And of course, genealogy was absolutely beyond important in documenting who our ancestors were, the islands that they came from, the traditions that they brought to Louisiana from the Canary Islands. So, you know, what's, what sparked my interest in the history of Louisiana is that one, my maternal family has been here since the beginning, and then two, particularly where the Canary Islanders were concerned, I saw that they had been an underserved and a, a very poorly treated group. And so I said, these people deserve more. They're part of my heritage. I'm proud of them. So that's why I did what I did. So I've been tilting with windmills like Don Quixote for generations. And I should also tell you that in the 1970s with my maternal grandfather, I started going to the Louisiana Division of the New Orleans Public Library. Colin Hamer held forth in those days. So I was even younger than Jay when I started. So you see, uh, history is fascinating and the history of Louisiana is wonderful. Thank you. Okay, uh, I grew up Jewish in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. I grew up going to a Jewish summer camp in Mississippi, which right there, that phrase, Jewish summer camp in Mississippi, is sort of, you know, a little bit of cognitive distance there. Um, and when I went to uh, and when I went to that camp in the 70s, uh, there were kids there from Dumas, Arkansas, and from Vicksburg, Mississippi, and from Cary, Mississippi, and from Opelousas, Louisiana, and from uh, all kinds of little towns all over the place. Uh, all these little towns had these Jewish populations. Um, but they were quickly disappearing. When I was at Tulane getting a graduate degree in history, I wrote uh, a paper on the Jews of Port Gibson, Mississippi. It's a little town. Not that interesting, except to me it's very interesting because I spent lots of time there learning about how uh, the Jewish population 
starting really in the mid 19th century up until like the mid 20th century was very influential in the town. Um, and I, I, I just found the story fascinating. My thesis committee thought it was good enough for me to graduate. So I did, and I've been working in museums ever since. When, uh, when they came to me and said, we want to open up the Museum of the Southern Jewish Experience in New Orleans, I was working at the World War II Museum, and they said, hey, why don't you come help us do that? So I did, and here we are. Bob's your uncle. Thanks. And about in with my story, uh, if you know me, you know I have a company called Our Man. Yes, I'm a crazy lady that did that. But I did it for a reason. Dr. Morrell says I was called to do it. But I work for many institutions. I've ran across a lot of these people through many museums. But the one thing I did not see, I did not see my family history in a museum, although I knew they lived here for many years. And it's simply because most of my ancestors were A, enslaved, or B, domestic servants. They were laborers, and I didn't see those stories really told. I saw a lot about free people of color, I saw a lot about Creoles, and so I saw this photo of my second great-grandmother, Belle Jefferson, and everybody had this photo. My grandma Belle was just Mama Belle to everybody. And um, so I saw her photo, I thought she was important, so I started looking up her life story. And I realized she raised four generations of our family. And so I created the company in honor of Mama Belle. I wanted to acknowledge what she did because no one else remembered her. No one else cared to tell stories about the domestic people in Louisiana and the laborers and the carpenters. No one talked about that. They always say the people that built the house. Those people were my people. So I created this company, and yes, I wear the dresses and the hats of my friend Frank. And I get out here and I tell those stories with the hope that other people will find their apartment on their trees. And it's been so great to see all of you today. As my friend Barbara said in the back of the room, it feels like a genealogy reunion, right? We don't all get to get together and hang out and take photos with each other because nine times out of 10, we're hiding in the cemeteries, we're in the archives, we're in the libraries, you can't find us, right? So we get excited when we see each other and it's certainly been great to do this. I'm happy that Amanda and Christina love me enough to entertain my crazy ideas. And so I'm really happy to see this. I look forward to seeing events like this across the state. And the reason why I say that, New Orleans, yes, we're big and we're great. But again, my ties are to the rural community. My friends will tell you, I'm just as much Baton Rouge as I am New Orleans. And I'm very proud of that. I come from that stop. And I believe that events like this should be held all over. Although we're here in New Orleans, we have ties to the community. Because of my husband's ties to Blackman Parish, I'm there just as much as I'm in New Orleans. And so I want you all to support each other when you get that invitation to go to these events and other places, please show up the same way we did today. Like it's so, it feels so good to see so many people in the room who are dedicated to preserving our history. We're able to do this because of you guys. Now, last plug, go over to the table over there. Go buy one book. Now I don't care what you do with the book, but I think you buy more, two, three dollars. Buy a couple of books. And the reason why I'm saying that is because when we purchase those books, one, they don't have to take them back. But two, you're helping to support programs like these. And we want to be able to show them that we love doing this. We love having programs like these. I want you to go stop by these tables, get to know other people, join these societies, and share your input and feedback. So thank you all for coming. Thank the panelists for being here. And I want to say this, look at how big the stage is. We've had a lot of people that could be up here. We wouldn't have any more space. It would feel like a graduation. So if you're not up here this year, maybe next year, or the year after that, or at another event. We love you all. We thank you all. As Amanda said, we'll go bigger next year because we don't, we don't have enough space. So this is a great problem to have. So thank you all again. Go over to the table, not all at once, but go buy something, go stop at the table, talk to these people, and support these organizations. Thank you again, panelists, for coming. And yes, Mr. Howland, you have a voice that folks will never forget. Yeah. <laughs>